grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our sermon text this morning comes from our gospel reading from John chapter 11. We read verses 17 through 27 and 38 through 45. So when Jesus came, he found that he, that is Lazarus, had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. And many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. Then Jesus again, groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone, Martha. The st take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you believe, you would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound, hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Loose him and let him go. Then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things Jesus did believed in him. So far from God's holy word. You may be seated. Dear fellow redeemed, beloved of God, death is one of the ugliest words in the English language. In fact, it's such an ugly word that we go through pains to try to eliminate that word from our speech. We try to euphemize it, don't we? Instead of saying that someone has died, what do we say? We say that someone has passed away, right? We try to say it without having to say those words, die or death. When we go to someone's funeral, we don't like to use that word funeral. We like to talk about it as a celebration of their life or as I sort of prefer, a victory service. And there's good reason to call it a victory service. But we like to avoid talking about it as a funeral. Maybe one of the greatest euphemisms of all on this subject is life insurance. <laughs> Think about life insurance. When do you collect on life insurance? Not when you're alive. You only collect on it at death. But we don't call it death insurance because we don't like to talk about it that way. We don't like to talk about death, and yet it's something that's all around us. With only two exceptions, Enoch and Elijah, every single other person who has ever lived has died. As much as we might try to ignore it, as much as we might try to euphemize it and put it off so that we don't have to deal with it, the reality is that death is a part of our everyday lives. And unless the Savior comes before we die, we too are going to face that. We certainly have faced that in our own congregation recently with loved ones. And we certainly are going to someday face our own death as well. It's because of that reality and that reality that is such a part of our lives that this section of John's Gospel is so beautiful. It's so comforting. Today our Savior wants to remind his disciples, that's us, 
his followers that we have no reason at all to be afraid of death because the Son of God appeared to destroy the power of death. And this morning, as we consider this great miracle of the raising of Lazarus from the dead, let's let this truth reign in our hearts and minds. May this be our great confidence as we stare this reality of death in the face that Jesus destroys death. Now, we're picking this account up in the middle of what's going on in verse 17 of John chapter 11. And you probably remember what happens before this. Word reaches Jesus that Lazarus, who is a good friend of his, is sick. And so Mary and Martha, who are also good friends of Jesus and who were the sisters of Lazarus, they send word to Jesus. They know what Jesus has done. They know that Jesus can heal the sick. They know that he can give sight to the blind. They, they know that he can open the ears of the deaf. If there's anyone who they can turn to here in their time of need in their brother's sickness, it's Jesus. And so they send this messenger off, and they send this messenger to say, go find Jesus and bring him back so that he can heal his friend Lazarus. Well, this messenger arrives, and he says, Jesus, your friend Lazarus is sick. And then do you remember what Jesus does? He does absolutely nothing. He just sits there. And he waits two whole days and then decides that it's the time to go. Well, in the meantime, Lazarus passes away. And so by the time Jesus finally gets to this scene, Lazarus has been dead now for four days. Can you imagine what it must have been like to be Martha and Mary? You have these messengers sent off to your close friend Jesus, and you're thinking, surely he's going to put off whatever he has going on, and he's going to come right away to keep Lazarus from dying, but he doesn't do that. And so Mary and Martha are just there, and they're waiting and waiting and waiting. Imagine what it would have been like to be just powerless, sitting there and waiting. And it seems like your friend, the one whom you have come to believe to be the Savior, it seems like he's disappeared. It seems like he has disappointed. So now four days later, when Martha finally hears that Jesus is on his way, when Jesus enters the town, she goes out to meet him. Maybe there's a little bit of anger in her voice when she first speaks to him in the first few words that we have in our text. Or maybe there's some sort of disappointment. But I don't want to focus on those words so much as the words that follow that. Though she might be angry or disappointed, I want to focus on those words that show that great faith that Martha displays. And so let's look at verses 20 through 22 again. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Now is Martha asking here that Jesus would raise Lazarus from the dead? I don't think he is. I mean, I guess it's possible, but... When you hear the reply to what Jesus says in verse 23, your brother will rise again, Martha immediately thinks to the last day, to the resurrection, when God will raise all people from the dead. What we ought to see, though, in this little exchange between Martha and Jesus is her trust, her faith that Jesus has a purpose behind everything that he does. And even though she might not know what it is, She's willing to trust him anyway. Again, verses 23 and 24. Jesus said to, says to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise in the resurrection on the last day. And you might ask, well, where did Martha get this confidence from? Well, this isn't new. You could see this hope of the resurrection even in the Old Testament. Look at those words of Job chapter 19, verses 25 through 27. Words that we often read on Easter, where Job writes, For I know that my Redeemer lives, 
and he shall stand at last on the earth, and after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another, how my, eye, how my heart yearns within me. So we see that hope from Job in the Old Testament, that he was going to rise in his body and be with the Lord. Of course, Jesus had also been a close friend of Mary and Martha and a frequent guest in their house, and so certainly he would have been teaching them, and undoubtedly he would have gotten to teaching them about the last day, that he would come to raise all people from the dead. And so even in the midst of this terrible situation, even in the midst of her despair, Martha confesses her faith. Jesus, of course, though, has something completely different in mind from what Martha had in mind. Jesus isn't thinking about what's going to happen to Lazarus on the last day. Jesus was thinking about what was going to happen to Lazarus on that very day. And so he picks up on something that Martha says. Martha said, yes, Lord, I believe that at the resurrection my brother will live again. And then Jesus says, well, I am the resurrection and the life. And then listen to these words and how amazing they are. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And then Jesus goes one point further. He says, and whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. And I want to focus in on that word never there. That word never in the Greek is the strongest negation that you can have. There are different words that you can use in Greek to negate something, to say that something won't happen. This is the strongest one. And so if we were to try to get this across in English, we might say something like this. He who, he who lives and believes in me will never, ever, ever die. It's that strong. And after this amazing statement that seems to fly in the face of all of her experience in this fallen, sinful world, Jesus asks Martha, do you believe this? And what a beautiful answer that we get from Martha in verse 27. Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. So what are we supposed to take from this conversation that Martha and Jesus have here? What's the take home for us? who wrestle with death in the same way that Martha did. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. With those words, Jesus promises that you and I, though death is most certainly going to come to us unless he returns, even though we die, yet we will live again. Through faith in him, we have the assurance that we will live again. Our bodies, which will be placed in a casket or in an urn and lowered into the ground, this body is going to hear the voice of Jesus again. Our bodies are going to rise again. We are going to live with Jesus in the glories and splendors of heaven forever and ever. Jesus says that we who believe in him, even though we're going to physically die, we are going to live spiritually forever. And again, Jesus says, whoever lives and believes in him shall never, ever, ever die. What a promise. What a promise of this deliverance from eternal death, this eternal death that we so deserve because of our sinfulness. Our bodies are going to die, and yet we will live forever and ever. And why? Why can we have this confidence? Why can we trust these words? Why can we believe these words that Jesus said to Martha and know that they apply to us here today? It's because Jesus has destroyed the power of death by his own death. Jesus knew what he was talking about here when he says, I am the resurrection and the life, because he knew what he was going to do. He knew what he was going to do to make it sure that we would rise again. He knew that he was there to go to the cross to make that sacrifice for the sins of the world. 
He knew that he was going to pour out his holy, precious blood to wash us clean from every single one of our sins. He endured God's righteous anger because of everything that you and I have done wrong. He suffered death and hell and being forsaken by God so that we don't have to face those things. We never, ever have to experience eternal death. But not only has Jesus experienced death, but he's also experienced life. He's the one who rose again, uh, rose again on the third day. He was wrapped in those, in those cloths and placed in a tomb, and he ripped those off. Well, he didn't rip them off. He took them off and laid them neatly there, folded them neatly and left them in the tomb. He who was put to death on the cross was absolutely, for sure, raised again from the dead, as many witnesses could attest to. Jesus had conquered death. He had destroyed death. Jesus went into that cage match with death, a fight to the death that Jesus won. Jesus comes out the victor. By his death, he destroys death once and for all. And what does that mean? It means then that he has the power to give life to whoever he wants. And guess who he wants to give that to? He wants to give it to you. And he wants to give it to me. That's the take home for us. Well, and that one question then that Jesus asks to Martha. When we're confronted with all of this, then we have that same question. Do you believe this? When you're sitting with grandma in the hospital and you can tell that her days on this earth are swiftly coming to a close, when you yourself go into surgery and you sign that paper that says that nobody in your family can sue the hospital if you don't wake up from this procedure when you face the ugly reality that because you have sinned that death awaits you that you're going to die jesus says to us do you believe this do you believe that i am the resurrection and the life do you believe that though you die you will live when we see jesus who hung on the cross when we see him who rose from the tomb this Jesus who suffered death and hell and rose to life, who has crushed death by his death, we can respond right alongside with Martha. Yes, Lord, I believe. I believe because who you are, because you are the Son of God, the Christ, the one coming into the world, the one who destroys death not just for me, but for the whole world. It's a beautiful conversation between Jesus and Martha, and it reminds us how important it is for every single one of us today to have our trust and our hope in Jesus because he's the one who destroys death. There's no hope to be found anywhere else. And just so it might be clear that Jesus' words are true, remember what he does. This talk of resurrection, it's not just empty talk because he goes to that tomb where Lazarus was laid. And he says, take the stone away, move it. And of course, Martha says, no, you can't do that. He's been dead for four days. His body is decomposing. There's going to be a stink. And Jesus says, oh, no, there isn't. Just do what I say. And the one who called the world into being with just words, the one who said, let there be light, and there was light, calls to Lazarus and says, Lazarus, come forth. And he who is the resurrection and the life brings Lazarus back from the dead. Lazarus walks out of that tomb. They take his grave clothes off of him. And we see for sure that Jesus is the resurrection and the life, just as he has promised. In this very powerful chapter of John's Gospel, we have really two proofs that Jesus is the destroyer of death. First, we have his words. We have his promise. We have that promise that he is the resurrection and the life, that we who believe in him are going to rise from the grave, and we have this proof in the fact that Jesus himself died and rose again. And we also see that proof in the fact that he raises Lazarus from the dead. And that's the proof for, for us that as he raised Lazarus, so too he will one day raise our lifeless bodies from the grave. And we will join him in that new heavens and new earth. 
It's a remarkable statement. It's a remarkable thing to believe. The world will ridicule and mock us for putting our hope in these things. But today, when Jesus asks us that very pointed question, do you believe this? Do you believe that I am the resurrection and the life? Do you believe that I have destroyed death? By his grace, by the faith that he has given to each one of us, we can look to him and answer, yes, Lord, I believe and have that assurance of our salvation. May God always keep us in the faith and always keep us trusting in him as the resurrection and the life. In Jesus' name, amen.